Hello and welcome to this episode of Greater Somerville. I'm Joe Lynch. My guest on this program is the state representative, Mike Conley, from the 26th Middlesex District in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Mike was elected to the district seat, which encompasses parts of Cambridge and Somerville, in 2016 and assumed office in January of this year. The district seat, encompassing parts of Somerville and Cambridge, um, Mike ran on an agenda, a progressive Democrat agenda of social and economic justice. He is concentrating on affordable housing, public transportation, and education needs of his constituents. Mike, and Mike is an attorney by profession. He and his wife make their home in Cambridge. It is my pleasure to welcome him back to Greater Somerville at SCAT TV. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Thank Congratulations you. once you. again, wow. your victory in November. It was your second time running, second time running for the seat. Indeed, yeah, it was uh, truly an honor and an accomplishment. It was a collective accomplishment, you know, to be able to, uh, to challenge an incumbent and run for the seat. I certainly, you know, think it would, uh, it would make sense to acknowledge the service of Representative Toomey to, to Somerville and to Cambridge. I'm, I'm happy to say he's continuing to serve as our city councilor in Cambridge. And um, so you're still working with Tim Toomey in a different capacity. That's all. Absolutely. Yep. And, and as you know, and I'm sure we'll get into it, there are just so many things going on uh, both here in Somerville, uh, right across the line in Cambridge. Um, I'll, I'll actually point out, as you mentioned, um, that I'm from Cambridge. My street, Harding Street, where I live, is right on the Cambridge Somerville line. Right. So I'm practically a Union Square resident as well. Um, so as I joke with you all the time, you can see Somerville from your house. I can. I can <laughs> actually uh, see from my kitchen uh, the, uh, you know, the tower up here on the hill. Right. I always look forward to New Year's Day because it looks like they, they bring the big flag out on that day. So That's I right. I can right. see it right from my kitchen and uh, it's, it's always a good feeling to to think about um, you know I think it's cities. terrific that the uh, well this is municipal election year here in Somerville so I always feel much more relaxed when I bring on the state folks Senator Jalen was here last time out uh, right. representative provost representative Barber and now yourself I always feel much more relaxed because you guys aren't running this year exactly so. I know and and it's such a you know I'll also add it is so uh, terrific to be able to serve with the Somerville delegation in particular, um, with Senator Jalen, Representative Provost, Representative Barber. We um, we just you know we really think very similarly and we have a similar approach, and so it's been wonderful for me to enter the state house and be able to look to them. Um, for some leadership and guidance um, as we look to serve all of our constituents here in Somerville. It sounds like a terrific arrangement, and we don't have that kind of arrangement in Washington. No. Um, unfortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you voted, there is a new administration in Washington. We're taping in late March, and as we speak, we just both looked at the, um, the feeds coming in from the national news organization. Um, the Trump administration has tried many which ways to overturn many of um, the initiatives that have been done over the past eight years during the Obama administration. As we speak, it looks like the Affordable Health Care Act may stay intact yes. as of the taping of the show on uh, March 24th. March 24th, March 23rd. I'll take your word for it. Yeah, so um, your thoughts, though. I, you know, I've asked Senator Jalen, I've asked Representative Provo, Representative Barber, the thoughts that you have representing a fairly heavily Democratic area within Massachusetts, which is no secret, a very blue state. Your thoughts on what's happening here in light of what's happening in Washington? Absolutely. Well, you know, when you, you mentioned how I won the election last year, so our big race was the primary, the Democratic primary in September. So there's a story I've been telling about uh, the general election date, uh, November 8th. I was running unopposed, having uh, won the primary, and so we had a nice party planned at Slumbrew um, down on Ward Street, right near the Hacienda, right mm -hmm. in my neighborhood, right on the Cambridge Somerville line, and, and uh, Caitlin at Slumbrew had a whole thing of balloons planned and we were gonna drop balloons at the end of the night and everyone was gonna celebrate you know, the Democratic victory. And then around 10 p.m., 11 p.m., uh, I started to notice you know, 
people weren't looking uh, mm -hmm. good at all. And then I started seeing people in tears, people crying, you know, people uh, hyperventilating. <laughs> and we started to realize that the unthinkable um, was actually uh, about to happen. And, and Donald Trump was elected president. You know, we never got to drop the balloons. And so the, the next day, you know, I spent, you know, all day just trying to process this shocking outcome. And, and I really arrived um, at a conclusion that I've heard echoed by a number of folks in our community um, and in the Democratic Party. And that is that, you know, I think we have to play defense and we have to play offense at the very same time. You bet. And so by that, I mean, you know, to the extent that Donald Trump or the Republicans in Washington uh, look to carry out any of their you know, racist, white supremacist, xenophobic, sexist, misogynist, um, any of that hateful or ignorant agenda, you know, I'm confident that we as Democrats and that we as Somerville and Cambridge residents and folks in Massachusetts, I'm confident that we will stand up and defend and protect everyone who lives in our community and really um, defend our American values. But yep. at the very same time, I'd just add, that's not even sufficient because as we know in the right. year 2016 too many people in our community too many people across our country um, were facing circumstances that may not have been just that weren't equal that weren't fair and so we really have our work cut out for us because we can't um, backtrack but we also can't just um, stay pat we have to think about how we can actually move forward and create opportunity and fairness for everyone. And so that's an extraordinary challenge, and that's really the challenge, I think, of our time. Right. I'm sorry about the phone. I don't. I think the last show that was Donald in here. Donald Trump might be a The Trump administration complain. is calling right now, they, Mike. They you can use the phones like that. You, you know? are not bashful about saying <laughs> what you think about the Trump administration. So that might be on them on the phone. But I know. sorry about that. I think the last show that was in here was a call-in show. So. Maybe the next time you come back, we'll do a call-in show. Right. I wanted to get your take on it because, you know, a lot has been written about, um, you know, blue, especially blue states. You know, right. Massachusetts is the bastion of progressive democratic uh, thoughts and policies. The problem comes in, and, and, you know, I've been fairly critical of some of my fellow Democrats, is you cannot think that the rest of the country thinks the way that we do. Right. We, we live, and I've said it before on the show, sometimes we live in a silo, or we live in a bubble, or we live in, you know, we're not listening clearly to the issues of middle America, of America in the South, of America, America in the West. You know, we, we have coastal voters, if, right. you, if you think about it. You know, East Coast, West Coast, we're not that much dissimilar. Once you get into the middle part of the country, their issues, their needs, their wants are almost the same as ours, but they think differently on how to get those. So for me being, you know that I'm a member of the city committee here in, in the city of Somerville, Democratic City Committee, I've been pushing that and saying don't rest on our laurels. You know, it's, and it's something you and I had the fortune of attending uh, Attorney General Maura Healy's town hall. And she was echoing that. Get outside of the bubble. Speak to people that you know who live in the middle part of the country. So I, I wanted your take. I knew what it was going to be, Mike. I mean, you and I think oh, yeah. alike and, on and that I stuff. And I will add, so. you know, I think you, you, know, you make a good point. And, you know, we have to recognize as Democrats that we have some real problems as a party. I mean, I have seen these statistics that show, that say, I, you know, in the last decade or so, Democrats have lost on the order of 1,000 seats nationwide, mm -hmm. state legislative seats, congressional seats, governorships, mm -hmm. obviously the presidency. And so clearly, I think as a party, we also, in addition to the, the offense and the defense and everything else, we do need to do some soul searching and really ask the question, why are we you know, not prevailing? Because even though here in Massachusetts, you know, we have a Democratic legislature, we have a Republican governor, um, many states, most states, have Republican control, mm -hmm. you know, across the board. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a lot of work to do there, and I think a lot of it has to do with um, really the economic situation in sure. the country. Sure, sure does. The 2008 Great Recession, um, there are so many folks in our country who, for them, 
they just have never made a comeback. You know, right. they may have lost their job, um, they're saddled with debt, they have health care expenses, and you know, we as Democrats, it's on us to not just say how bad the other side is, but to take it upon us to show people, here's the policy that will make your life better, and that's why you should support us. And that's going to be a, it, you know, we didn't arrive in this situation overnight, so right. it, it will take right. um, a real collective effort. Well, as someone who is much smarter than I am, has always said, oh. <laughs> both parties, the Democratic Party and Republican Party, have to learn that old mantra, when you're in a hole, put the shovel down and look for a ladder. Yes. I mean, there has to be a way out of this, and I'm not so sure anybody has the answer at this point, but um, let's move back into district here for a little bit. Sure. Um, you are now serving a good part of uh, the eastern part of the city of Somerville, from Assembly Square over into Union Square and onto the Cambridge border. What are you hearing from constituents in light of um, how well Massachusetts is doing compared to the rest of the country, but still facing those problems of affordability, jobs, you take it from there. Sure, well, you know, um, I know we've talked about this before, you know, here at SCAT TV, um, from my perspective, and I think from the perspective of constituents in our district, what, what they say to me on a daily basis, of course, you know, we continue to come back to this challenge of affordable housing. It is so palpable you know some people call it a crisis I actually looked up the definition you know in the public health literature of crisis and crisis is not even strong enough of a word it's truly an emergency and then after an emergency if you don't address emergency the final stage is disaster and you know my fear and I know many you know folks here our fear is that we're approaching a disaster and that disaster would be the loss of the middle the complete loss of the middle class a city that could end up becoming just a place for rich and poor. And we're seeing that, you know, so much in Cambridge and it's starting to permeate into Somerville. And so, you know, continuing um, the theme of my campaign last year and the theme of the work that I've done for a number of years in these communities uh, is this issue of affordable housing. Um, certainly, uh, you know, I spent, as I mentioned before we came on the air here, I, I spent this morning with Somerville Community Corporation. We had uh, donuts with the delegation, so um, got to join um, the you know tremendous advocates and activists who are working with Somerville Community Corporation. I really look to them for leadership on this issue. Um, I said to them this morning, I said, you know, you all have an all-star team <laughs> assembled here of uh, thinkers and organizers and affordable housing experts. So, um, and passionate people, and passionate. very passionate about what they do. Absolutely, yeah. and, and really, you know, the, the challenge is that at present, so many of the policy tools are the same tools that we've had for 10, 20, 30 years, but the shape of this economy is now so different. You have people, picture this, you know, you're, you're waking up in the morning, you have more money than you know what to do with. That, you know, that, that's the challenge for some people in our world. And they say, hmm, you know, I could buy stocks, I could buy bonds, I could put my money into savings. And then you say, aha, I'm going to buy that property right over there. That's the best thing in this entire planet to do with my money. Now, you know, that's a positive thing. That says a lot about, you know, who we are as a city, who we are as a state. And that's something that on the one hand, you know, we can celebrate and hopefully benefit from. But it's also an extraordinary, um, you know, course of events that this is where we're at, that the community we live in is a global magnet for investment. Sure. And what that now I think what's incumbent upon us as policymakers, as leaders in the community, is to really work together to figure out what are the policy mechanisms that we can put into place to help capture more of this value and help translate this, um, the value that's been created over the years in the community and translate it into something that benefits people who are living here right now. And let's that's stay, really my mission. Let's stay on it for a minute, Mike. You know, the, an, an emergency or a crisis or a trauma, however you want to label this thing, usually indicates immediate response, immediate action. The problem, I think, and this is n not you, you're fairly new to the, the political world, 
the problem I see and what I hear from, you know, viewers and people on the street is that government moves too slowly when it comes to these things. And I asked, um, I, I think it was probably Mayor Curtis Tony, I asked him in, in one of these conversations that I have, we constantly talk about having to catch up with what's happening in our economy. Is it too late? for a city like Somerville. We're redo, redoing zoning. We're trying to get community benefit agreements out of the developers. The developers are saying, but if I give you that, I'll have to cut back someplace else. Is it too late for us to attack the affordable housing and the jobs uh, while all this development is going on? We have no agreements with these big big developers. It's, you know, it's, it's a great point. And, you know, I think the sad fact is, sure, for for those who have been displaced, you know, they, you know, it, it is too They're not late. coming back. It is too late for them. And, and I actually, you know, I'm an optimist. I would love and I hope that we can, to the extent feasible, people who have been displaced find new places for them to live in our community. But for, you know, certain individuals, you know, if you've been displaced, it's uh, a very tough thing. And we, we saw some news report this week, again, sort of thinking in this public health context, um, you know, looking at the human toll that this takes. I mean, can you imagine? You're talking about the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Uh, well, that too. But, yeah. but I'm talking about um, the toll that being displaced takes on you. I'm sorry. You know, yeah. That's okay. Um, because, you know, you think about housing, it really, it's not just a, a functional thing. It's also your identity. You know, right. where do you live? Right. That, you know, that's the first or second question after, you know, who, where, where do you work? Where do you live? It's really your identity. And so, you know, to me, it's not just um, a policy matter or numbers on a page. It's also recognizing that every person who is displaced, that, that is a traumatic, you know, loss to people who want to stay in our community. Um, but getting back on, on track with your question, um, you know, as we think about this and is it too late, I don't think it's too late insofar as I don't think we've seen the half of it. This is a globally attractive location, mm -hmm. and we are now living in an era of you know profound wealth and also wealth inequality. And so, given the fact that we're so globally attractive, we're we're close to Boston, we're close to these institutions of learning and innovation. We have so many different economic opportunities in this urban area um, of Greater Boston. Uh, I think the pressure is actually going to continue. Yeah, I agree with you, and I've said it many times before that there are two things. You know, people are saying, we understand it's a global thing. We understand, I often joke with the mayor that, you know, it's your fault, Joe. You made Somerville sexy again, right. you know. But it has to do with, with the economy, number one. It has to do with our proximity to the capital city of Boston. They're outgrowing themselves. They can't keep pace with the demand. Cambridge is outgrowing itself. It can't keep pace. The natural boundary of, you know, the borderline between, it's merging, it's blending. So it is only natural that they're gonna come to Somerville, which is, you know, mile and a half, two miles to downtown Boston, because we have available land, right. not much, but it's going through gentrification. It's going through re revitalization, redevelopment. And the reason I ask, is it too late, is because, you know, we warned, there were some of us who warned the city back in 2000, 2003. One of the reasons some of us, me, came back to this city is because it was affordable. Because I mean, I wasn't... I, I thought you were a billionaire, Joe. I, yeah, I'm a billionaire. Anybody who believes that, <laughs> talk to Mike later. Um, but, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to do very well in my former career, lived in Boston for many, many years, came back to Somerville for two reasons, affordability and my parents were aging. And I saw that. And I saw the same thing that I saw in sections of Boston when I first moved there in the 80s. It was affordability and it attracts people who are making a good income because it's a good deal to right. buy a condo before you know it. You know, the condo that I bought at $130,000, $140,000 gets resold for $600,000. Oh, yeah. So that's happening in Somerville. We see it. The real estate is demonstrating that every single day. 
the problem I've always had with how slowly municipalities work, or even the state government, is that if you see the train coming down the straightaway, why aren't we doing something to prevent th that catastrophe of happening? Again, you're new, so we're going to have you back here in six months and say, what did you do since the oh, last yeah. one? But what's happening on the state level? Well, first I can report um, <coughs> something me. I'm really excited about. Uh, so I was sworn in January 4th, and um, you, know, you have about 10 days to file new legislation. It's right. very hectic. Um, we're all uh, in a single shared office, all the new representatives. There's 12 new uh, state representatives this year. That's out of 160 in the body. Um, I like the ratio. We have 11 Democrats and one Republican in our class, so I, I think that's fair and balanced. And, um, <laughs> and on top of that... Let's talk to the Republican, see if okay. he thinks it's fair and balanced. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, on top of that, then you have about two weeks to co-sponsor legislation, um, and then that brought us up to about February. Then in the month of February, um, you make your committee requests, and then committees are announced. And right now, this month, we've been organizing our committees, right. meeting our committee members. So back to our uh, point about housing, I'm certainly uh, proud and excited to have been appointed to the housing committee. So I'll have an opportunity to really be front and center um, in these discussions on Beacon Hill. I'm also uh, uh, glad to know that uh, Rep. Christine Barber is also on that committee. So Somerville will have um, some extraordinary uh, representation in these housing discussions. We are, you know, in the housing committee, it is expected that we will be taking up things such as a bond bill to fund a lot of our affordable housing programs and try to increase that funding. Um, I'm advocating um, my some of my top requests right now in the budget process, which is also now underway, um, would be more funding for affordable housing vouchers, trying to help, you know, stabilize and protect folks who might be living here but are seeing increased rents and need to access a voucher um, right. to continue living here. Um, so let that's me just a little for, bit about what's going for on. For the viewers, Mike, let me just point them towards your website. We're not at the end, but okay. let me point sure. them towards your website because I'm, I'm impressed. I, I've looked at your website and you're um, almost two pages full of bills that you are either sponsoring or co-sponsoring this year. So Yes, I... Uh, I submitted 13 original new pieces of legislation, which was, uh, uh, I guess I'll brag a little bit, was well above average for a new legislator. I co-sponsored over 400 uh, pieces of legislation, which was also above average for a new legislator. Just to put that in perspective, there are on the order of 5,000 or so bills in any given session. so. Um, lots of stuff to look at up there. You're going to be a busy man up on Beacon Hill. It's been really busy. You know, my day has basically been, um, you know, wake up, go to the state house. It's certainly, it's a wonderful commute. You know, I feel sorry for the people who have to come in from Pittsfield or the Cape um, because obviously we're, we're very close to the building. So I go in, um, work there all day. I try to make a community meeting or two. I know you've probably seen me out. Uh, We've seen each other three times over the past month. Yeah, yep. you know, trying to uh, stay active. I, you know, I really take that seriously. You know, I think of myself as someone who came into public office really based on that activism, on that engagement in the community, right. and I don't want to, uh, you know, lose sight of that. I want to stay that person who is engaged, who's active, who's out there. Um, and then, you know, I typically have been then spending the last couple hours of my day, you know, tuning into C-SPAN. I'm a political geek, <laughs> so, um, and a policy wonk, so I will, you know, tune into the train wreck that's going on in Washington, D.C., and listen to some of these debates about health care or the Supreme Court. Mike, I, ha I have to say I admire you. You're one of the few politicians I've ever met who admits to watching C-SPAN. Oh, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's a great thing. I mean, Trump hasn't shut it down yet, so um, I'm sure it's going to be called Trump Span um, before too long. T-Span. 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 Yeah, you got it. That's a good one. Let's move back into the district a little bit. Next yeah. week, I'm having uh, as the guest on one of my episodes is John Dalton, who is oh, yeah. the uh, man who has been appointed to put the green line back on track, get yes. the thing done. 
Uh, John is going to come in. He's talking about the latest iteration of the Green Line. I know it's important to you. I've seen you many, many times at Green Line meetings. The importance for the Union Square District and what that's going to mean to constituents. Well, I mean, it's it's really uh, you know it will transform Union Square. It, it, it's very important, um, but at the very same time, you know, I'm highly cognizant of the fact that it it will mean that property values will go up, and that creates added pressure on affordable housing. And that's why, you know, I and I know there are those who might try to pit one against the other. I I love the word and. I think what we need is world class transit and you know robust affordability provisions and protections job for opportunities people. and affordability job opportunities as well and so you know it it's so important for union square it's important for somerville uh you know as we've talked about before i mean and as you know i mean this is something that has been decades in the making right. um i you know have been impressed with uh john dalton's you know experience and his professionalism you know he was sort of a big um, you know, hire from the MBTA. Right. They went out to Chicago. Right. They sort of plucked him away and, and brought him here. So he's sort of like a, uh, you know, like a new quarterback um, being and he's signed. Not, I like the way you say he's a quarterback. He's not a novice either. Right. He's handled multi-billion dollar transportation initiatives across the globe. Right. So, yeah, let's hope, let's hope Green Line comes before I have to move into the VNA on Lowell Street. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I'll also add, you know, before you move on, you know, in addition to, you know, wanting to see the project executed and in addition to wanting to protect affordability, you know, another huge piece is the Somerville Community Path, which is something that, you know, we are as a delegation, you know, fighting for. You know, I can remember um, I took time out from my campaign and went to a, a meeting with, with Lynn Wiseman and the Friends of the Path. Sure, yep. And, uh, you know, I said to her, I said, Lynn, you know, um, how long have you been doing this? And she was, and I think she said, well, you know, since the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, my goodness, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry that I, we, I can uh, verify because that was the year I met uh, Lynn Wiseman and her husband, Joel Bennett. Yes. Yep. And, Talking you know, about the community path. And I said, you know, I, I just, I want us to get this done. Um, for our community, and it's certainly something that we're doing all that we can to keep the pressure on, recognizing that you know, we also have a Republican administration that right. may not right. um, be seeing that as a state priority, but we're pushing forward and reminding folks of uh, the importance. Um, it, it is um, not an understatement to say that Washington is now the horse of a different color, so we're going to have you back at some point in the not-too-distant future. Maybe we'll talk about uh, state versus federal. See how they can, absolutely. See how they can work together. Mike Conley, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you want to get a hold of Representative Conley? He's at mike.conley at mahouse.gov. Uh, give him a call up there. Leave a message. They're all shared. Six one seven seven two 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 four two five. My guest has been State Representative Mike Conley. As always, stay safe, stay informed. See you next time.